Okay, I think we're gonna try and get going now. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so uh, happy to see you all. I can't tell you how um, delightful it is to be able to have specialists assembled together to look at great works of art and to feel free to exchange ideas and be completely unrestrained and relaxed. And that is the SoCal way I've learned. <laughs> and I hope that you'll find the tenor of this, this day's event to be very um, warming, and uh, it's intended to be. So please, um, I hope we can be casual. I had envisioned um, people interrupting each other constantly. Um, I, I don't really think that we need to stand on ceremony. Um, we do have people to introduce ideas. Uh, and there are PowerPoint presentations, and I know that um, most of us intend to then move into the galleries uh, to talk more in front of the objects after doing a brief PowerPoint presentation. So now I'm also told that for the purposes of the video, and yes, we are being videoed, um, that it would be most effective if you spoke into the mic if you are commenting from um, where you're sitting right now. So the handheld mic would be given to you if you want to say something in particular while we're sitting in here. And when we move into the galleries, uh, this gentleman is going to pick up his equipment and physically move it with us, and it already has a mic attached to it. So then we won't be using the handheld uh, in, in the space. So does that make sense to everybody? And I, I know that there actually is a form that technically you need to sign to give us permission to post the uh, videos on YouTube or on our website. So um, if you'd be so kind, unless you have a real paranoia about being uh, seen in the public sphere, which I actually kind of have sometimes. Um, but if you are willing to do that, that would, be, that would be great. I know that our audience and our docents would really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to make my remarks very, very, very uh, short because, again, this is really all about you and what you guys have to say. Um, I just thought it would be maybe helpful for you to have a little bit of insight as to how the exhibition is installed. And you know, this is one of those things that curators fixate on and think a great deal about, and we're always incredibly disappointed because nobody notices. So I'm just, you have to indulge me a little bit. <laughs> but um, you know, as you know, repeatedly we've talked about the fact that part of the impetus for the show was the discovery of this one painting in the private collection. And you know, because I want to teach people, but also because the issue of attribution becomes so delicate in this day and age, um, it seemed important to surround this painting with autograph works and to also include student work in art, art, order to facilitate that type of distinction in hand. So that's part of the point of the installation, but obviously uh, we wanted as well to give an overview of the career as far as we were able in a sort of mini monographic format. Um, but also we wanted to be able to convey a sense of the power of the monumental work, which we couldn't borrow. Um, I don't know when the last time, the last words of Marcus Aurelius was really lent to anyone. Um, certainly it's never crossed the ocean, and it's really a condition issue. But um, in this day and age, it's sort of a, a weird um, blessing, but also a curse, because the digital age makes it possible to uh, manufacture rather compelling large-scale facsimiles and um, you know it's always a little bit problematic because they compete so thoroughly now with actual works of art uh, and it is something that I've already cautioned our docents about because they themselves become fascinated by the digital reproductions <laughs> so on the one hand however it does allow us to convey a sense of the heroic proportions the format and if anybody has made me sensitive to issues of format it's Mark Gottlieb um, and it seemed important that we remind our, our viewers here, at least, uh, of the ambitiousness of Delacroix's uh, scope and range so that we would understand the difference, therefore, immediately of the smaller, easel-sized works. Um, so that's part of the way that I was thinking in terms of the kinds of facsimile reproductions we have on the wall. Um, we also wanted to make this space more intimate. We have a looming exhibition space that well accommodates large contemporary objects. In this case, most of the objects were easel sized, so we're always concerned to try and bring the visual attention down. Um, we're also trying to avoid the incredibly looming 
rooftop overhead. Um, and then, you know, I've never, I have to confess, I was most excited about the rugs only because I've never used rugs in an installation. And um, those were uh, provided as an in-kind donation to a certain extent from one of our trustees who owns the company room and board. So if you are interested in the rugs, you can actually purchase them online. Um, although the blue and green one is uh, uh, no longer available. So that's the last one. Um, um, yeah, otherwise, I'm not sure if there's really much more that I wanted to add. I, I do uh, hope that we can actually broach some of the more mundane questions of connoisseurship, quote unquote, and of the attribution problem uh, of the, the status of the catalogue raisonné. It's something that Nina Kallmeyer and I were talking about a little bit last night, but it does seem to me that we're in a bit of a crisis um, only because now you read about it all the time, especially when it comes to issues of valuation, of forgeries and fakes. In the 20th century market, it's really a critical problem, but even in the 19th century art market, it's becoming incredibly more so. And since the discipline of art history throughout connoisseurship and this whole activity of being able to discern, you know, the whole connoisseurial eye got thrown out a long time ago from the discipline, uh, I know that I was taught that it was no longer a part of our concern. And it is, in a way, a, a sort of uh, pressing issue because there is, isn't really anywhere else that these things can be taught than in the academy. Um, it can be taught in the world of the art market, but these things are so tainted by so many other motivations. And I think that there need to be standards for um, the juried, in a way, uh, scholarly version of a electronic catalog raisonné, and there has to be a way of facilitating this. So, so I'm hopeful that we can apply for money from uh, various foundations, the Crest Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, to hopefully originate such a mechanism. And I would be really grateful if uh, we could at some point brainstorm a little bit about that. Um, but so without further ado, and I, I also wished I could have found a photograph of Lee Johnson, I kind of feel that we owe him something. And um, you know, he had a, a very interesting life and a rather tragic end that I know some of you know about. And um, Michel Anouche, who contributed so uh, eloquently to the catalog, was quite close to him. And I know that uh, she would have wanted for us to uh, remember him. Um, and hopefully he's happy that someone is still uh, very invested in, in Delacroix, as all of you are. Um, so uh, with that, yes, I think we should start with our first speaker. So, Gulru Chakma, who is going to speak to us about repetition and media. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Gudru Chakmak. I'm an assistant professor at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, at the moment, I'm wrapping up my book manuscript on Jean-Léon Jérôme and the crisis of history painting in the 1850s. So this has been a fantastic opportunity for me to step away from that project a little bit and to think about problems, issues in the 19th century uh, from a different perspective. Um, so I'm going to talk about a painting that haunts very many of the paintings that are in the gallery today. Um, and I'm going to, I look forward to discussing it more with you once we're in the galleries. At the Salon of 1838, Delacroix's unexpected turn to classical mythology that is imposing Mede Furieuse was hailed as a positive, if somewhat perplexing, development. The painter of Dante and Virgil, of the notorious Sardanapalus, and the tragic modern history scenes from massacres in Chios, the painter of the vibrant East, was now trying his hands in a theme with a pedigree in tragedies by Euripides, Seneca, and Corneille, as well as in Ovid's Metamorphosis. The artist considered this painting a breakthrough in his oeuvre and included it in his retrospective at the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1855. As we think through Delacroix's relationship to classical themes and motifs in the context of this exhibition, what I would like to bring to table this morning is the artist's persistent pursuit 
of the tragic motif of Medea, to which he returned repeatedly in the course of his life, as well as the impact this theme had on other paintings he made. And here's our Medea, right underneath the Marcus Aurelius. Although not present in our exhibition, Medea is intimately linked to a number of works in the galleries, including Lycurgus and Pythia, St. Sebastian, and Fanatics of Tangier. In today's session, I'll focus my observations to its ties to Lycurgus and Pythia, and make a case for how an uncanny otherness lies just beneath the skin in Delacroix's classical bodies. Delacroix began mulling over Medea as early as in 1824, and after a long period of gestation, exhibited his first painting on the theme at the Salon of 1838. The painting shows Medea, the barbarian princess of Colchia, in a grotto. A dagger in her left hand, she holds her two struggling children in a tight grip. After everything she had done for her husband Jason to get hold of the Golden Fleece, using her powers of sorcery, even betraying her own family and fleeing to exile, Jason's infidelity left her enraged and vengeful. Delacroix depicts Medea in the aftermath of her preliminary act of vengeance. She used her magic to kill Jason's bride-to-be, as well as the bride's father, the king of Corinth. Her anger hardly quenched. She is resolved to hit Jason where it will hurt the most, death of their children. In a typical fashion, Delacroix returned to this theme time again and again throughout his life, producing numerous drawings and no less than three more oil paintings in addition to the Salon version, in which he thought about this tragic heroine, debating her mood and state of mind as she built up her resolution to kill her own children. This slide shows three of the oil versions of Medea. On the left is the first and largest of them, Medea Furieuse of the Salon of 1838. The one in the middle shows a version he completed in 1859, showing Medea and the children outdoors in flight. This painting was destroyed in the Second World War. The canvas on the right is one of the two Medeas he made in 1862, the year before he died. We can see that in this painting, he goes back to the motif of the cave and to the 1838 composition. Sheets of pen and ink drawings show Medea vacillating between expressions of anger, insanity, and deep sorrow, as Delacroix combed through a diverse range of emotions experienced by this tragic heroine. The Salon painting pushes all outward expression of such emotions just beneath the surface, so to speak, and yet boiling, ready to erupt. Here, Delacroix shows Medea and the children in a cave, ostensibly to take refuge from their pursuers. However, a closer look shows that this primordial grotto is uncannily animated and is perhaps more than just a hiding place. Medea's cave is akin to a predator's lair of the kind Delacroix had started exploring in the previous decade in his wild animal studies. Indeed, Medea's composition closely follows an early etching Delacroix had made of a tiger in its lair. Both are getting ready to hunt, seated by the entrance to their cave, mouth half open, single left eye with its slit for a pupil peering out, watching. Their faces are half in shade, indicative of a merciless ferociousness brewing within. But of course, if Medea's ferocity equals that of a tiger, her maliciousness, indicated by the slight hint of a smile lingering on the edges of her half open mouth, is hers only. Literary sources describe Medea as a sorceress, in communion with Hecate, the dark goddess of the underworld, as well as with the Furies. While Delacroix's Medea does not collect magical herbs or chant incantations, her otherworldly powers do enchant and animate the world around her. A fluorescent green hue spreads from where she steps with her left foot, rousing the flora. Tendrils come alive, curving, slithering. Her long black hair transforms into feelers, blindly reaching out into the darkness of the cave. Through such details, Delacroix shows the otherworldly powers that nourish Medea. While Delacroix does tricks our imagination into seeing plants transform into serpents and scorpions, 
glimpsing in Medea's hair, tentacles in motion. The predominantly red color scheme of the painting also urges us to picture the tragic event that is yet to take place, the murder of the children. A single eye of the elder son, bloodshot, pierced through an opening, although he has not been harmed yet. The intensely crimson hues on his, as well as his brother's skin, not only catch a reflection of their mother's robe, but also stimulate the viewer to imagine the horrific bloodshed. While closely evoking the forms of multiple 16th century models, Medea thus inverts the values represented in them, be it Raphael's or Leonardo's holy virgins lovingly watching over baby Christ, or Andrea del Sarto's charity in the Louvre selflessly offering her breast in a peaceful meadow. This underlying percolating alterity developed in the motif of Medea is a theme that runs throughout Delacroix's work, a threatening otherworldly power brewing underneath, which in Medea's case, will exceed rational control, but one which, when harnessed, can be utilized to establish the law and keep the order. In Lycurgus Consulting the Pythia, one of the pendantives Delacroix prepared for his decorative cycle at the Palais Bourbon Library, we see just such an evocation of the motif of Medea with all its underlying connotations. The scene shows Spartan lawgiver Lycurgus who consults the Pythia, the Delphic Oracle, and through her, Apollo the God, regarding the durability of the laws he intends to put in place for Sparta. Lycurgus holds sacred laurel leaves and has sacrificed a goat on the altar in front of the Pythia, who is seated on her tripod. As Plutarch describes in Parallel Lives, Lycurgus would go back home with the famous divination that the god granted his prayer for good laws and promised him a constitution, the best in the world. What is not shown in the Palais Bourbon scene, but what is yet to come for this prophecy to be made, is that the Pythia, as the vessel of divine revelation, would enter a state of convulsive agitation as she gave the oracle. Possessed and in spiritual ecstasy, she would mutter seemingly inarticulate sounds, words spoken through her by the god, which would then be interpreted by others. In the painting Dark and Aloof, the Pythia emerges from the shadowy recesses of her cavern, which in turn are exacerbated by the smoke rising from the tripod on the floor next to her. In her robust chest and arms, disheveled black hair, face covered in shadow, we trace her kinship to Medea. Both figures embody forces that underlie the visible world and shape it, boiling within and leading to extreme acts exceeding rational thought and ordinary human prowess. Her bloodshot left eye peers at the viewers, a small but subtle reminder of her connection to the other worlds beyond this one. In her single exposed breast, she goes back to one of the likely sources for the media, Del Sarto's charity, with which Delacroix had noted his fascination in his journal as early as in 1823, declaring it to be superior to Raphael's holy family. If in the Pythia, Delacroix remembers Del Sarto's charity, this is a memory that is filtered through the media. If the athletic and classical body of Lycurgus connotes the civilized order brought to the world through divine sanction of law, the figure of the Pythia, therefore, assures in a different set of associations, highlighting the fragility of civilization, its darker undercurrents. Michelle Anouche, in her essay for the catalog of the present exhibition, highlights the logic of inverse mirroring that underlies the structure of the Palais Bourbon library imagery. Scenes of peace and virtue are countered by those of violence and barbarism. Anouche gives the episode of Lycurgus and the Pythia as one of those connoting serenity. Thinking on the figure of the Pythia as an extension of the Medea motif brings the cycle's theme of civilization and its destruction into the very heart of this otherwise reassuring image of divinely sanctioned legislation. The easel painting in the galleries next door, Lycurgus Consulting to Pythia, today at the collection of the University of Michigan Museum of Art, is a variation on the Palais Bourbon painting. This work makes the Pythia's connection to the Medea motif even more explicit and elaborates further on it. Here we see the cavern in more detail. 
two amphorae, a plate, and a scroll lie down on the floor by the altar. The painting modifies the Pythias pose. Her right hand now covers her mouth and supports her head as she looks towards Lycurgus, as if listening to him intensely. Her long, dark, wavy hair falls down her back in strands. The tripod in the lower right, whose upper edge is merely suggested in the Palais Bourbon Pendantif, is now shown in full view. A serpent curves around it, possibly decorative, although it belies being simply a metallic ornament. Its fluid upward spiral, green scaly skin, and dragon-like head, with almost a malicious expression on the face, makes this an ambiguous figure, transgressing the distinction between real and illusion, akin to denizens of Medea's cave. The fluid brushwork that determines the dark green contour of this creature, especially towards the upper part of the tripod, continues in the fire in the tripod and the smoke billowing out of it, as well as in the fluid brushwork on the Pythia's dress and hair. Her face is now fully in shadow. In fact, the darkness covering her face is specifically emphasized by contrasting it to a few small passages where light reflects off and momentarily illuminates this otherwise obscure figure. In the shadow completely covering the upper part of the Pythia's face, in her long wavy unruly hair falling down her back, but also in the snake climbing the tripod, as well as, as in the serpentine lines of fire and smoke, even in the S-shaped squiggle that highlights the Pythia's bodice, the serpentine motifs that animated Medea and indicated her dark powers emerge once more in Lycurgus and the Pythia. Signed but not dated, the Michigan canvas raises a few questions that have not been satisfactorily answered to this day. The first question pertains to its purpose. Was it a preliminary study for the Palais Bourbon Pendantif, or was it a later variation on the subject? It wouldn't have been surprising for Delacroix to revisit the Palais Bourbon Pendantif later on in a small rectangular canvas. He had done exactly that for another painting in our exhibition, the Hercules and Alcestis of 1862. This small canvas was a variation on one of the lunettes he had made for the Salon de la Paix of the Hôtel de Ville. While the lunette was destroyed in the 1871 fire, a drawing by Delacroix's assistant Andrieux records what it looked like. We can see how Delacroix, revisiting this motif almost a decade later on, expanded the landscape, added witnesses in the left background, and also offered a glimpse of Hades in the right. In the critical catalog, Lee Johnson described the Michigan painting as an exploratory oil sketch for the Pendantive, made sometime in the early 1840s. After it served its purpose, Johnson argued, Delacroix might have signed it and given it to Francis Petit, the first recorded owner, who then sold it to Goupil in 1873. Similarly, in a 1969 article, Robert Beaton suggested that the Michigan painting might show Delacroix's first ruminations on the theme of Lycurgus and the Pythia, with a number of details that were eventually suppressed in the final pendantif. The common attribution of the Michigan paintings dates to 1840s goes back to Alfred Robo's 1885 catalog of Delacroix's works. Robo suggested 1842 as a possible date for the Michigan canvas, based on its resemblance to a pastel study today at the Louvre, which was offered by Delacroix to Théophile Torre in 1842. We know from Delacroix's assistant Louis de Plenet's notes that he began painting the large canvas for the Pendante in the December of 1843, based on an oil sketch given to him by the artist. Now this oil sketch is lost today. In any case though, the pastel study of 1842 preceded the actual pendantive painting itself by a year or more. The attribution of the year 1842 to the Michigan canvas, just on the basis of its resemblance to the pastel seems problematic. In fact, the pastel seems to have aspects of both the pendantive and the Michigan canvas in an embryonic manner. The figure of the Pythia, long black haired, 
breast covered, hand covering mouth, gaze directed at Lycurgus, resembles the Michigan painting. The overall composition itself, on the other hand, is closer to the Palais Bourbon pendentive. The hexagonal format, the summer indication of the tripod, and the lack of other accessories. On the basis of this limited evidence, the possibility that the Michigan canvas was a later work in which the artist revisited this subject and elaborated further on the Pythia's resemblance to Medea in the cave cannot be eliminated. There is one more point regarding the Michigan canvas that makes it a compelling puzzle. Beaton pointed out the difference in coloration in the lower left and right corners, especially salient in the left in this slide, arguing that originally this canvas might have been painted in the shape of the pendentive. And this is the color difference that I'm talking about. And a little bit here. According to Beatum, the Michigan canvas lost its pendentive format in the bottom half due to a later repainting. He also suggested that the traces of this later retouch were clearly visible under ultraviolet light. This brings me to the other and final problem, whether a different hand touched the painting after it left Delacroix's possession. Beatum suggested that the lower corners might have been filled in later on. Similarly, he argued that a foreign hand added highlights to Lycurgus's back as well as on the sacrificial animal on the altar. He also drew attention to the feebleness of the handling of the lower coils of the serpent around the tripod, arguing that this might also be a later addition. According to Beaton, the retouching must have been done before 1885, since the line drawing in Robot's catalog showed the painting in its current state, already filled in. Lee Johnson, on the other hand, argued that as late as in 1897, the canvas was still in its original state in which Dologra had signed it, and whatever tampering happened should have taken place after that date. Johnson offered as evidence a photograph of the painting published in 1897 catalog of the Donatis collection, suggesting that the lower corners in the photograph are barer than those of the present canvas. Johnson's evidence seems inconclusive to me, since the use of flash in the photograph clearly washed out many details. This exhibition gives us an excellent opportunity to study the Michigan canvas side by side other works by Delacroix and think through whether it was a preliminary sketch from the early 1840s or a later variant, whether it was completely by Delacroix or subsequently embellished by a foreign hand. If from the early 1840s we may expect it to have stylistic similarities to, for example, the presentation sketch for the entry of the Crusaders into Constantinople or the oil sketch for Marcus Aurelius, Alternately, if it's a later work, it may better fit in with the artist's technique in such works as Juno and Aeolus from 1856, or Hercules and Alcestis. No matter if or when the retouching was done, the Michigan Lycurgus and the Pythia participates in the world Delacroix created around the motif of the tragic heroine Medea, a world in which the presence of an uncanny female force marks the fragile boundaries of order and civilization. Um, I have a totally superficial one. Um, maybe I missed that in the talk, but why was the Python, the Pythia Python sort of added there? Um, I didn't mention it or I didn't say anything about it. Um, yeah. Nobody really discusses it, but I believe that it's a further extension of the of Delacroix's imagination mm -hmm. of Medea's cave. A sort of primordial cave yeah, yeah, where sure. she's and tapping into the underworld as she's in conversation with Hecate, in a way. And, and you know that on the Acropolis, for example, when before the, the Parthenon and all those oh. classical buildings were built, um, there was a worship of um, snakes, okay. underground dogs, uh -huh. um, and there was a divinity uh, called Erechtheus, uh -huh, who was uh -huh. the kind of ruling divinity of uh, the snake world underneath. Mm -hmm. And eventually, that more prehistoric cult was developed into the Olympian gods. Mm -hmm. cult. So I wonder if it has to do uh, with the fact that she's in a cave in an almost underground location, yeah. right? 
And this is the chronic spirit, the spirit, the mm -hmm. spirit that she's in touch with. It's at the same time, it looks a little bit like an altar. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a sacrificial process going on. I mean, they're offering something there, yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. It's really mysterious. And mm -hmm. I wonder why he added that afterwards. Uh, but it's not on the, on the library. Um, it's not. Yeah, yes. It yeah. is just, yeah, just the tip of the tripod is in the library. Yeah. Right. And, you know, according to Lee Johnson, this is not probably a completely Dolokra edition, especially if we go with the idea that this was originally painted without these ah. sections. Mm -hmm. So you would see the top of the serpent, but Robert Beaton says that especially these final coils don't look Dolokra like. Don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now, you know, this entire idea of like, why on earth are you painting it, the bottom half in the shape of a pandante, while the top is still flat, doesn't have this, you know, convexity of the pandante. What is it that you're imagining, you know, when you're partially imagining this painting in this contained space still? So that's why, you know, the question whether was he trying to come up with this originally, you know, in the early 1840s? Or is he really somehow still fixated on the idea of the pandantive shape? Later on in the 1850s, perhaps even in the early 60s. Because, um, you know, we're always talking about an unproblematic transition from, you know, to the net to the rectangular or easel. But, you know, is he thinking further about the constraints and you know, experimenting with them? Um, well, to me, what strikes me is that if he did originally paint it like that, it adds to the claustrophobia and the feeling of being underground, the feeling of the oppression coming in from above. The other thing that struck me when I looked at all the versions of, of her is, goes back to what Claire said yesterday, is the sort of sometimes fudging of anatomy. There's something off with this first, this leg over here. It's like placed on top of the other. <laughs> And it's very ambiguous in space. It, it looks from the top as if it ought to be on the other side, but it yeah. isn't. And, and I thought that was very interesting that in all the versions, my eye immediately went to it. Um, and that they're all like that. It was, it, and it jumps out at me. Um, so, and obviously he wasn't all that interested in the anatomy, because you see the poignancy with which the animal has been done, mm -hmm. and the, the, the luminosity of the colors, and the care and sensitivity given to the surfaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder about uh, our conservators, if there is anything yeah. obvious about the surface of the painting that might give away the <laughs> closer. Especially whether she has any thoughts about this, this color difference, what might be the reason for that? I would say some of these brush strokes, these kind of parallel lines, don't really match. Eric, could you speak up just a little bit? Oh, sorry. I would just say that some of these little brown lines don't really match the width and the variety of brush strokes that you see in other places. I'm just looking at, at these over here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they do look kind of, um, they look different to me than the brushwork in the rest also, of the picture. the bottom part of this serpent, the modeling looks very different. You know, it looks more feeble, mm -hmm. the, and the very bottom part corresponding with this shape. Um, it looks like it could be by a different hand, mm -hmm. and looks like it could be retouched. I mean, the discoloration in this area is much la less than on the left, but still, I think you get the sense of a very sharp line here. Yeah, I mean, and, I think, and that corresponds with sort of a different hand. Right, I, I think exactly what Claire says. You know, when you look at the, the bottom loop of this uh, serpent, and you compare it to the handling, the brushwork of the rest of the serpent, you know, not only is it darker, but it's just much more linear. There's not kind of this flow of, that you see with the brush and the rest of the work. So, and we're lacking any highlights, too, right. which are, exist on all the upper part. 
So I think that, you know, that's I think like that's a, a convincing idea that, that later. Was painted, that was, yes, originally in the shape of the pendentive. Mm -hmm. And did right. you have any thoughts about why there is this sort of color difference between the two houses? Because it's better? it's been, oh, I just think the darker pigments have maybe discolored. Right, more. right. You know, if you put oil, oil on top of oil, it might match originally. Mm -hmm. Although, maybe it didn't match originally. <laughs> this, this and uh, darker in and a then way. with time it would get even darker. Right. So this corner, should that be darker than this corner? No, I think what we're saying is that it re what happens is that when you retouch with oil, uh, the oil has its own aging process and it will darken with time, so it may have originally been a closer match. Okay. With time, it just gets darker and stands out more. Okay. I think both corners have discolored, but mm -hmm. this one is obviously discolored a lot more. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't match either, doesn't and it's, mm -hmm. why it's, it's one of the reasons why our eye is picking it up. Mm -hmm. But you see no so. evidence that there were uh, pendentive kinds of yeah. issues at the top, too, right? And the brushwork at the top is very in sync with the rest of the picture. Yeah, I don't see it. I'd say it's very in sync. It's the brushwork on top is so very it's much like the brushwork in the rest of the picture. Right, well, because the top would have been squared off of the pen pendant shape, right. as opposed right. to the moon's cut into the lower part. Do, do, do we have an x ray graph of this painting? Not that I know of. It would be very easy to do with such a little painting, and that could really answer mm -hmm. a lot of questions. Right. In other words, very often what you see is what they call cusping. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a canvas painting, not a panel painting. So, for instance, if you don't see any cusping, it could very likely have been cut on top. Mm -hmm. Or if you do see cusping, and, and cusping, of course, would be uh, the edge of the picture where it's, it's pulled over oh, the stretcher. Where the nails and are. where the tacks are, there's almost like little C's between the tacks that you would see in the x-ray. Um, and uh, if it were cut, let's say over here, you wouldn't see those little C's. Or if you did see some of them, or if maybe you saw some of them just in the middle, um, mm -hmm. you know, that would give you some indication of what the original top might have been. I wonder if either... I don't want to volunteer anybody, but if, before it goes back, if the Getty might be willing to x-ray it, or if that were too, too complicated, perhaps um, Alfred Ackerman at the Detroit mm -hmm. Institute of right. Arts would be willing to do it. I think it would be a great opportunity mm -hmm. to know more about that. So. I think it's interesting, though, looking at, you know, even if those panels were cut away, this one does seem to have other details that are not included in the other one. Yes. So thinking about what the purpose of this one was, if, you know, Dulacqua was, or, you know, with issues later with Andre Yu in charge of the state sale, I don't remember the provenance exactly of the painting, um, you know, thinking about it on a more intimate level, because, you know, I noticed that these vases here were not included in the, or the pendentive versions no. mm -hmm. or in the pastel, mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. of this, um, it seems like fabric around base of scroll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's not in it as well. Yeah. So thinking about, you know, if those are later editions as well, you know, adjusting it to mm -hmm. the market, or if they were original, how he was thinking it would be viewed compared to the ones that, mm -hmm. you know, are so distant on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first visual records that we have, uh, as I showed in the project, there is the uh, line drawing from the Robo catalog of mm -hmm. 1885. But we also know that Delacroix himself gave this away, signed it and gave it away. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, to Francis Petit, and then Francis Petit sold it to Goupil in 1873. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it left Delacroix's hand. At least we do not have any other evidence to the contrary, mm -hmm. let's say. So, go, maybe this is by Jérôme. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he put the squiggle there. <laughs> maybe one more. Exactly. One more later. He's learning how to point to that because the signature. It's interesting where the signature is located. Mm -hmm. right. If Eric and I are right, which I think we are, that these are later editions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's, he's positioned his signature mm -hmm. in towards the center. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all we'll consistent. Get eclipse. Mm -hmm. Uber, one of the things that may really stand out <laughs> in this one, I don't know where in the sequence it is, but in terms of its purposefulness, this is the only version that has the delicate um, flow of dripping blood from the eviscerated mm -hmm. goat. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's very beautifully done in three or four long drips. Mm -hmm. and, and in some ways connected to 
the, this as uh, very much a small easel painting rather than something in a for large format mm -hmm. where that kind of effect wouldn't have been decorous, let's just say. Mm -hmm. so, I'm, so they're rather nice. I'm fascinated by, and always have been with our painting, with the fact that the eyes fall and shatter just as Medea does. Mm -hmm. and, you know, are there other instances in Delacroix's work where, you know, these women with special gifts, mm -hmm. you know, sibyls, mm -hmm. oracles, sorceresses, have that kind of, you know, you can't, the light of day is not shining on, on their powers. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at the pendant of in situ, mm -hmm. that sibyl, that Pythia mm -hmm. doesn't have her face in shadow to the degree that this one does. Exactly. And I was wondering what your thoughts might be uh -huh. on that. She is, I think, further in the cave. There's still an indication of shadow covering sort of mm -hmm. her entire bust, but her skin is darker. Mm -hmm. Sort of more of an Eastern woman. But you, but you get a, a real sense that yeah. you know, the light that falls on, like her just, mm -hmm. you know, falls from her shoulders mm -hmm. down, but the her head, and then even more her, mm -hmm. her eyes mm -hmm. are lurking in the dark. In the exactly. I mean, there are experts here, you know, whose visual memory is much more powerful than mine. The, one of the images that really jumps out to me, and it's not necessarily like a sorcerer or something, mm -hmm. but, you know, the women of Algiers. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, she, she again belongs to yeah, that the light image. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What else? Which other females have their eyes in shadow? Uh, uh, are oh, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead, go ahead. There definitely are, though. But I can't think of one off the top of my head. So oh. I'll yield to no, you. No, I just wanted to pick up on, on the idea of um, the woman's features as indicating some kind of background. You mentioned the women of the East with their mm -hmm. darker skin. When you showed the media and you uh, put on the detail of her face, yeah. the profile, I was struck by the very specific tilt of the nose, you know, the mouth, the relation mm -hmm. of the cheekbones to the eyes, etc., yeah. as being an entirely different type from the Greece on the ruins in Salonghi mm -hmm. or Liverpool mm -hmm. on the barricades. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he consciously imparts some kind of anthropological authenticity. Mm -hmm. And we know from the travel to uh, Morocco in 1832 that he wrote an anthropologically minded a manuscript mm -hmm. about the right. people he met mm -hmm. and their customs and their dress mm -hmm. and their looks. So, um, has anyone spoken about this? I mean, the, the types, I mean, we tend to, to talk about the de la Croix type, mm -hmm. but it's not quite so, right? Mm -hmm. There are differences and I mean, maybe informed by yeah. ethnicity? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the drawings mm -hmm. for Melek Medea, you know, I mean, he's really thinking about this since the late 1820s mm -hmm. and making certain drawings that we can trace Medea, Medea is not Greek, she's a Scythian, um, she's a exactly, 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 she's not Greek, yeah. but for example, the drawings that I showed, yeah. you know, there's one with the strict Greek profile, so mm -hmm. he's, you know, this sort of tragic heroine, mm -hmm. like tragedy, mm -hmm. that's it, it's like, so she does have confused yeah. that with something else, she has that, but then, you know, other types of inflections, but one thing that I didn't put in my presentation is there's a caricature of Delacroix, uh, in Charivari in 1839, I think, and he's standing in front of this big easel, and you know, Mede is sort of you know, partially a bush then, and you know, his profile looks exactly like the profile of Mede because he's you know, representing himself in all these paintings and making them ugly in a way. Do, and it, maybe this is something that all of you know, um, but not going back to Michelangelo, but actually going back to Greek and Roman sculpture. Mm -hmm. Did Delacroix do any kind of extended study of Greek and Roman sculptures that were available to him? Mm -hmm. I think, again, the specialist can answer this better. Mm -hmm. Nina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he was fascinated by classical antiquity, he drew medals, mm -hmm. he drew monuments, um, and, and then of course they get reformulated, but uh, I'm not sure how specific you uh, want to get, well, <laughs> depending it, on the project. Yeah. How about, how about Pompeii? Um, he never went to Italy. Yeah, that, that, that no. is what I wanted to sort of add, 
was to make sure we underscore the extent to which Telequest stayed away from Italy. Right, and, right. Um, and, you know, how Morocco functioned as a yeah. substitute. So it would be through what's in France mm -hmm. and, you know, casts and sculptures and mm -hmm. prints. But, um, you know, that's part of Telequest's classicism, is his mm -hmm. ambivalence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is an interesting moment in the journal, um, um, actually, it's in his letters, not in the in which he apparently has some kind of antiquarian dealings with, hmm. uh, yeah, with the Ministry of Culture of Napoleon III. Uh, someone uh, gave him um, a set of um, antique vases to authenticate and give his opinion on, and, and these were supposed to be sold either to the emperor or by the emperor. I can't remember mm -hmm. the details. Mm -hmm. But essentially, he was acting a little bit as a connoisseur of antiquity. Hmm. And we're talking about the 50s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, you know, there, there's something to dig out there. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Oh, I just kind of wanted to follow up on something Mark said, and <clears throat> also thinking again about the order, the possible order of the pictures. Um, I mean, Mark was saying something about this being maybe an easel painting in itself. Yet, if one were to think of the corners as being later additions, I mean, would there be an easel painting that had blank canvas in the corners, or is it possible that you know, there was, there is something original underneath this darker retouching, mm -hmm. and it might have been added later to make it look like a sketch for the final version, you know, the, the wall painting's version. I mean, it, it would be interesting to kind of maybe get a cross section or something like that to see if there is original Delacroix paint underneath the discolored mm -hmm. paint. And you know, it was added later, and there might, and it could be an easel painting itself, or you know, just to figure out the order of things. I mean, it would, for that matter, it would even be interesting just to see the painting out of its frame, right? So the mm -hmm. edges, right? Might tell you something. So I don't know whether or not we want to address any of the other pictures that you included in your talk, or uh, what would you like to do? I think you have a long time, so I don't know what the time is. Okay, and what is our time? Um, we're doing by it's 10.30. Mm -hmm. so. so do we have time to talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. this? I mean, because the one thing that I did wonder about was this issue of how you date. Well, mm -hmm. There are many problems here, but let's just say the, the main figures and the way in which they are articulated. Um, and is there a sense, does anyone have an immediate sense of whether or not it belongs in a later work category or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we, let's just presume that it's not a preparatory sketch, and that to me it doesn't look at all like a preparatory yeah. sketch, mm -hmm. and, but if it is, let's say, intended to be a finished easel painting, where does it fit in the manner of painting that we normally see mm -hmm. in Delacroix? Um, does it look like a late work to anybody? Mm -hmm. I mean, especially sort of highlights that we've been talking about. So Mendia's body, this sort of squiggle, the handling of the brush here around the serpent's head, and then here the smoke, and as Mark mentioned, certainly sort of blood dripping. Uh, there's a fluidity, like there's a facility, there's an ease. That's why I thought that we could also look at some of the later sketches slash finished works to see whether it fits there or whether in earlier Delacroix we already have this sort of, okay, here's a squiggle, mm -hmm. you know, this is a highlight, mm -hmm. and you're going to read that, decipher that right away, whether that exists. Do you want to look at the Phillips picture a little sure. bit more? Sure, sure, yeah. Can I just um, add the note that the painting is so much more coloristically rich than any of the PowerPoint images. Yes. I mean, yes. Um, yes. You know, you accept that for the argument and then you walk in here and it's... And something I'd the, also like to know is how much... The depth is just completely different. It is. I also wonder if it has a yellow varnish on it. Mm. Oh. Mm. And I think that it might. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, it looks like it has a slightly discolored varnish on it. Which would be consistent with the idea that it has some discolored retouches, that the varnish might be old and a little bit yellowed, and maybe a little bit opaque. Which is a way of saying, and the colors might have been even a little more intense than we're experiencing here. 
Mr. Adams, if I might just ask yes. a question with Al, just because we're still lingering at this work. You mentioned yesterday in your talk you had a problem with the persuasiveness of how Delacroix painted rocks and right. kind of hard, c c cavernous forms. Right. And well, as Guru brought out said so in your paper, it's very much um, a thematic, powerfully motivating force in these works from the 1830s and 1840s. So I was wondering, um, which I, I really loved what you said about this, the Scylla, the... Yes, the me, yes, yeah, and I was thinking, yeah, she's, she's right, you know, I have to look at that again, I've got to put my finger through it. Um, so I was just wondering, um, had you any particular comments, given that we've been looking at a lot of, a lot of rocks and caves? Yeah. And <laughs> Especially perhaps the upper left corner, right, where you see sunlight coming in, the opening of the cave. You know, oh, very good, He tried yes. to give some sort of a texture, but... Is but it's very fluffy, cloudy texture It's again? fluffy, cloudy, yeah. it's very <laughs> soft and generalized, uh -huh. I think. I think uh, what likes done, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> what strikes me on kind of a more formal note is just the extent to which the female figure has kind of become more cave-like, I think. Mm -hmm. The difference between um, the really beautiful, well-articulated figure of Medea and this woman with the, the curved shoulders, kind of like the, the opening of a cave, but also just this, just the deformed nature of the anatomy, as you, as Abby pointed out, um, I think is interesting. There was a contrast between Medea and the cave that she was in earlier. Now the female figure expresses that nature, I think. Mm -hmm. There were also the Daniel and the Lion's Den pictures that are extremely dramatic in this way with the, the, the stream of light coming in and yeah. all the play of shadow. It would be really interesting to look at the, the smaller versions of that subject. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see some of the same issues. There's also uh, what, something that Nina said about the Medea in this in terms of what you're talking about the ethnographic mm -hmm. capacity of reading the face. And the, in these both pictures, that cave likeness or the shadow makes that less available. In other words, there's a mm -hmm. sinking yes. in, a less availability of distinctive quality. It's like a lack of visual distinction. And, and in the Medea, the way he pulls it off is that intense articulation of the earring. Mm -hmm. The earring is the dazzle, yes. the bling bling that yes. kind of distracts from and makes the face recede. Mm -hmm. and, and here there's a really interesting that yellow, it looks like there's a little impasto like, that kind of matches up with the sheep, right? Mm -hmm. that, is she holding a, that, is it a vessel she's, or is, No, it's just it's a, her hand. I thought that that yeah. was just the highlights. The white comes in from here, mm -hmm. highlights. Highlight, so you see that her body is in shape. That's how I read it. But it didn't. Yeah, I don't think that it looks like she was holding. So. But in, in any case, the visual, visually, oh, oh. It, pop, it, pop, it asserts itself yeah. in relationship to the face. Yeah. I think it's also extraordinary if you think about it that the original. Pendentive was a public decorative work to be seen from a gigantic distance. Absolutely. And now Absolutely. it's translated oh. into this intimate. So Absolutely. the issue of indistinctness, which is so much a part of what Delacroix enjoys, uh, it's, it's so uh, inc I, I, incredible to me uh, how much he is able to let go of visible and readable facial features. And the amount of leaning in that you end up doing to actually discern the particulars of, of the figures is sort of extraordinary. I, I mean, for someone who's known as a great public painter, he seems to totally embrace the possibilities of, of the smaller intimate scale. Mm -hmm. that's I, that's so I really appreciate the, all the comments on the cave atmosphere and that wonderful combination you talk about the shadow over Medea with anger and sorrow and insanity. I just keep thinking of Cezanne's copy, his watercolor yeah. copy, yeah. where she's yeah. totally blinded yeah. by insanity and tragedy. Yeah. And he takes that cave metaphor uh -huh. in even Absolutely. deeper. So, yes. And I like the reference to Cezanne over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody like Cezanne. <laughs> we'll probably throw out a few more references before the end of the day. Um, and maybe, I was so taken I, in your essay by how beautifully you described the particular particularity of Delacroix's colors, like the teal and the salmon, 
And so I'm wondering with this, where the colors are striking within those, that color complement, if those have a particular chronology in this work in the smaller easel painting, like the late 1840s, the early 1850s, or not? That's a very good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, I hope we can hire some poor graduate students <laughs> to <laughs> survey something. That would be an interesting thing to track, though. It's interesting, to actually, how this installation, you know, and to compare it, I think, to Juno and Eros. Because we have a similar division, split the two different types of colors, again, to put the intense red versus, in this case, it's not blue, it's sort of something purplish. But he's sort of almost reenacting these separations, these distinctions, in different, completely different subjects and different compositions. The structure itself is moving on to the next composition. And again, it would be interesting, that's why, to find out, to get a better sense of the Michigan painting's date. Yes. yes. Is this around this time? Well, I wonder, you know, it's also just an yeah. interesting exercise to look yeah. at the colors. Because this is an ambiguous land of easel painting, decorative or translated to easel. Yeah. And it's relatively late. Yeah. Um, so this is a finished easel sized variation um, that dates to the last decade. So if we're looking at the way in which it's painted, it's not it's actually it's not that far off from the Michigan Lake Hergus. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the same fluidity of the brushwork, right? The same squiggles, highlights, the yeah. fire again, mm -hmm. yeah, the smoke. You're right, he's very, very he likes snakes a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Cave. Uh -huh. Apollo and the python. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, mm -hmm. yes. So I don't know if this is a logical point at which to uh, break and maybe start the next talk. Yeah. So um, if we can return to. And I'm going to be deliberately repetitive for a moment because I want. Yes. Is that better? OK. Um, I want to be deliberately repetitive because I want to join everyone in thanking Ike for this really splendid exhibition and for arranging the symposium and the Scholars' Day. Uh, it's really terrific. And that also means thanking Liz Brown and Caitlin DeFetti and everyone, I think, at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art who's contributed to really being a fabulous two days here. So thank you. Um, and I also want to say, having walked around the exhibition on Saturday, that. I, it was such a pleasure to see all of these Delacroix and student of Delacroix and assistant of Delacroix's works. Um, so I thought it was visually stunning and, and intellectually engaging. Um, so again, thank you. And then I have to extend a personal thank you to you because for inviting me to participate because I, um, it brought me back to Delacroix's art, uh, which I had um, moved away from, something I mentioned to a few of you. Um, after uh, Delacroix print catalog Vazonnet. Um, and that has been a very interesting process of coming back after a period of years and discovering everything that's been done um, in the meantime in terms of changing Delacroix scholarship. So it's been very interesting. Um, this morning, I am going to offer some ideas about uh, Delacroix, Delacroix's construction of the characters, Hamlet and Ophelia, in his Hamlet lithographs. And I'm going to focus my attention on matters of gender. And just very simply, what I'm using as a definition for that is the social uh, and cultural conventions of masculinity and femininity as they are operating in a particular historical place and locale. Um, and then matters of sexuality, and again, as a sort of simple introductory definition, um, for art, the presentation of the body in a, in a sensual or erotic fashion. 
And to begin with, though, I'm going to cover some basic information, so this may be familiar to some of you, but I wanted to make sure that um, I did cover it and everyone um, knows it. So uh, to begin with, what we're looking with at are the cover pages of the two additions to the Hamlet lithographs, and that's really the main point, that there are two additions. The first edition is the one that Delacroix himself published in 1843. And it was a relatively small publication. There were 80 sets printed, 60 on white wove paper and 20 on chincole. Um, it was not commercially successful. Delacroix lost money. Uh, and it had a mixed critical reception in the press at the time. So it's a manifestation of later in the century that it has become known uh, as, a, as a triumph in, in lithography and also in pictorial narrative. The second edition, and we're seeing the cover page there um, on the right, was published in 1864, so the year after T Delacroix's death in 1863. And it was published by um, a man named Paul Maurice, who bought the lithographic stones at the Delacroix estate sale in February 1864. Uh, and I think it's also interesting in our context that uh, Maurice was a, uh, a novelist, uh, an editor, and a translator, and he worked with Alexander Dumas on Dumas' uh, play and production of Hamlet in 1847. So he was very interested in Shakespeare um, and in Hamlet. The second edition is the one that's on exhibit. The second edition is the one that we are most familiar with. Uh, and it's most reproduced because of the fact it was a much larger run. So there were 200 Hamlet sets produced in 1864. And one of the things I've been thinking about uh, starting on this is certainly we can call the first edition, Delacroix's edition, um, can call it Delacroix's edition. But the second edition, I'm really wondering if we should consider it an unauthorized edition because it was done after his death and it included works as it turns out, that he did not intend to include. And I'm going to speak about that um, now. And what this relates to is that a basic difference between the two editions, besides um, the time at which they were published, is that Delacroix made 16 lithographic stones. But when he went to publish his edition, he took three of them out, and he did not include them. So the first edition has only 13 plates, uh, and these are the three that he had made but then did not include. So there's Hamlet rebuking Ophelia on the left. There is Ophelia's song or her, her mad lament in the middle. And then on the right, that is um, Hamlet and Laertes fighting or struggling in Ophelia's grave. Um, and of course, that's an interesting question in and of itself, which I think people just leave up to speculation as to why he eliminated those three. Um, nevertheless, he did retain all 16 of them because those were the ones that then Paul Maurice bought and then published all 16 of them uh, when he published uh, the entire 16 in 1864. When we're in the gallery where all the Hamlet lithographs are on display, I'm going to come back and refer specifically to these three, because I think, and particularly to the, to the two that feature Ophelia, because I think they have an impact um, when one's thinking about Delacroix's own production, own publication, on how we understand Ophelia, uh, because of the fact that he removes two prominent images of Ophelia in his own edition. And a third distinctive feature about the uh, Hamlet suite is that it, Delacroix took nine years to complete it. So the 16 stones were done over a nine-year period, and he dated the stones. So some are dated 1834, some are dated 1835, some don't have a date, and then some are dated 1843. Also within the, and you'll, you, know, you can see that obviously on the prints themselves, you can see the dates. But the other thing that's interesting about that is that the way that the, the um, plates are laid out in correspondence to the play is that 
you can see that the order in which he executed them does not, uh, in a strict linear fashion, follow the play. So this is a bit deceptive because this is the first plate with Hamlet um, and King Claudius and his mother, Queen Gertrude, and it is dated 1834. And the plate on the right is Hamlet dying and uh, everyone else dying, uh, which is the last plate, and that's 1843. So it looks as if it's you know sort of complete linear chronology, but that's deceptive. Um, that's not the case. So I think that's very interesting too, just a, apart from what I'm looking at as to how Delacroix worked, how he um, his drawing style changed, certainly by 1843, and that's very visible in looking at the prints, and possibly, and I'm still thinking about this whether his conception of the characters of Hamlet and Ophelia changed by the time he got to 1843. So the two images now um, are Hamlet and Polonius on the left, so a print that features Hamlet, and then on the right, uh, the drowning Ophelia, one of the prints that, that features Ophelia. And so to introduce um, my topic again, I was interested in thinking about what Delacroix's conception was or what his construction was of the character of Hamlet and of the character Ophelia. And I started out by looking at the prints, um, but also reading the commentaries in the 19th century and then continuing through into the 20th century. And so my initial answer to the question was that, first of all, he, I, I'm using the term mutability. He treats them as mutable characters, by which I mean he changes their physiognomy and he changes their dress within the suite. It does not remain consistent. And this is something that um, mostly is criticized um, about his work. Like, why didn't he keep Hamlet the same from plate to plate? You know, why change his physiognomy? Uh, so that's, a, that's a, also, I think, just a sort of over, overarching, interesting question. But within that, then I decided on a more finite level that with respect to Hamlet, that mutability extends to some gender ambiguity, by which I mean some equivocation between the character being presented as masculine or feminine. And I'll speak more about this when we're over in front of the prince, but that is also that something that comes up in the commentaries. And then for Ophelia, her mutability, um, I'm suggesting, is something that extends to a centralized or sexualized presentation of her body in this scene here, uh, the drowning scene. And so before we go into the gallery, though, I want to show some prior images that other artists did of Hamlet and then of Ophelia, so we have some sense. <laughs> Are you laughing at the fusilli, I assume, <laughs> on the top? Um, <laughs> Um, so, so, so we have a sense. What were the typological representations for representing Hamlet, late 18th century, early 19th century, before Delacroix? So yes, this is um, an engraving after Henry Fuseli's Hamlet and his father's ghost, uh, which was originally a painting made for Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery. And then the bottom is uh, maybe a little less well known, a German artist named Moritz von Retsch who did actually illustrated cycle, so that's relatively uncommon and is a precedent to Delacroix, um, of 16 outline engravings. And this one is Hamlet in the middle uh, with uh, about to stab Polonius um, behind the curtain on the left. So what I ha had in mind in showing these is they're drastically different, but they do both um, indicate to us that these artists embody Hamlet differently than Delacroix does. So on the top, you know, pretty clearly this uh, very muscular, athletic, um, sort of extravagantly muscled body of Hamlet, and in this lunging, amazingly dramatic uh, physical pose. Um, so I think, you know, pretty clearly we come away with this idea of this super heroic model of masculinity in a very corporeal way, aside from the sublimity of the ghost, which is also pretty terrific. 
And then um, on the lower uh, image, that uh, von Retz's Hamlet is, he's a fully mature man, and there's no question about that. And he has this wide, uh, assertive stance, and he's occupying the center of the composition, and he's actually occupying, I would say, the entire lateral stage space. So controlling Gertrude, um, and then also clearly Polonius on the left. So I think also another, another instance of where we get a um, commanding hero, uh, one with uh, uh, physical authority and also moral authority. Uh, so this is the kind of counterpoint um, I hope everybody can keep in mind as we uh, go look at Delacroix's Hamlets. And this um, <laughs> is a different Hamlet. <laughs> this is <laughs> Sarah Bernhardt playing Hamlet at the end of the 19th century. And I put this photograph in as a marker for the fact that, and this was something I discovered, I, I didn't know this at all beforehand, the 19th century was the era in which many, many female actors played Hamlet. Lots and lots and lots of them, just consistently throughout the century, and then culminating in Sarah Bernhardt um, at the end of the century. So therefore, I have to stop doing that. Um, therefore, uh, the photograph signals, um, I think, um, that Hamlet was associated with gender ambiguity in the 19th century in this larger cultural context, and specifically, most notably, um, on the stage. Yes, yes. It actually started at the very end of the 18th century with Sarah Siddons in Britain. And she did nine performances, so not a huge number. But yes, there's Charlotte Cushman, who is an American actress, but she spent her time in, in, in Europe. Um, I don't know as much about the American, but yes, there were American actresses playing Hamlet also. Um, and so Ophelia, uh, again, to give a counterpoint to what, to what Delacroix does, um, this is uh, two late 18th century prints, again, um, of representations of Ophelia for, on the left, Boydell Shakespeare Gallery, and on the right for Charles Taylor's um, picturesque beauties of Shakespeare. And I think very, very similar matrix uh, we see for both artists. Uh, Ophelia is a young maiden with long hair, wearing a long flowing dress. She's standing on the edge of the riverbank, and she's leaning over or for the um, smirk about to lean over and put this garland uh, of flowers onto the bow of the tree. And that's eventually the tree bow that will break um, and that she will, will drown in the river. So again, I wanted people to, to keep this in mind. Um, you've already though seen uh, Delacroix's Ophelia, the, the, the contrast between the two. And then two last images, and these are sort of a Fast forward to, to post Delacroix, um, which is, I hope these are legible. Um, the bottom is by the romantic sculptor uh, Auguste Creole, and he does this uh, bronze relief. It's fairly large, maybe two feet by six feet in the 19th century, but he actually does the plaster cast for this in right around 1843-44, so immediately around the same time as Delacroix. And so there's a horizontal uh, figure of Ophelia there in, in the water. And then above at the very top, small, about six eight inches by eight inches as at the end of the century, this is the Russian emigre artist um, Marie Bashkirtsev with a dying Ophelia. So if we can, yeah, move into the gallery. Um, for the play? Was he reading it in English, or was he? I don't think so. And that actually was um, uh, something important to look at, was with what French translations were available. 
he did see the English troop that came to Paris in 1827 and really was this extraordinary cultural event um, that, that everyone who was everyone was at. Uh, and that definitely had an impact uh, on what he was, was doing on everyone, and, and particularly the actress Har Harriet Smithson, who played Ophelia. And everyone writes about her, and he writes about her, um, and Berlioz pursues her and marries her because she was so extraordinary. <laughs> um, but as far as translation, the, the translation that was most prominent um, at, in the 18th century was by a man named Ducie, and definitely Delacroix did not use that because there's half of the prints he does are based on scenes that Ducie cut out. So there, Ophelia lives, Hamlet lives, they get married, there's no <laughs> ghost. <laughs> so you know, he, 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 he considerably adapted Shakespeare. <laughs> Um, but then not uh, this man named Le Tourneur, who did a translation that uh, 1776 about um, that was much closer, really authentic to Shakespeare. Uh, and that I, I think, and I've not been able to specifically pin it down, but I think that was probably his translation. And it was revised in the 1820s by uh, Francois Guizot, in fact. Um, so I'm assuming that's the one because it was much more closely matched um, to Shakespeare. Do any of you happen to know how uh, fluent Delacroix was in English? Very? Might have. Um, now, I don't know Shakespeare's English is, is a peculiar combination, right? Yeah. It's not uh, easy and flexible. I was wondering, is there a translation by Soulier? Oh, question mark. I don't know. Because I seem to remember yeah. that in his rule map he mentions that Soulier is reading hmm. uh, a French translation. Could be, could be. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. in France, in Paris, there is an explosion of the popular theaters, like mm -hmm. the Variété, the Fada, the Gaieté, on the boulevard of Montparnasse, which was becoming the big, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Broadway of Paris mm -hmm. at the time. And, uh, you know, I've read a lot of watered-up versions of this play uh, by the French hack authors who were then selling the scenarios to those theaters. And, you know, I know that Lacroix went to those, I know he wrote mm -hmm. about them, Well, it, it just strikes me that, that sort of under the surface there are so many connections to theater yeah. that they're in, well, obviously for, for the Hamlet, but that really ought to be, if possible, you know, tied together more because there was so much going on in the theater with, with Hamlet um, and Shakespearean plays, yeah. we can move again. Uh, so here I see her as, first of all, this fully mature woman's body, which is amplitude, which is classical uh, proportions. And so there's just so much tension to the statuesque body. Um, and then second, you know, uh, very obviously the dress has fallen away. So her breasts are exposed. Um, and then the third thing, um, the way I'm reading this is that it's, it's as if her dress has been transformed into to drapery, classical drapery, and it, it's clinging to her in, in the way you know, many classical statues, but also because of the water, and that clinging does cling to her thighs and cling to her vulva, so that that's part of this sensual presentation. Um, why I think that's important um, is because it brings together a few things, uh, 
One is that Delacroix is showing the act of dying. He's showing a woman, he's emphasizing the sensuality of her body. He is putting her in this horizontal position, and he is the first story, so it's really the inventiveness of this compared to the maidens on the banks of the river uh, standing. Um, and then you know, she is in a pool of water as well. So I think he's tied, visually, those ideas get tied together. And that seems to me significant because we know this becomes such an iconic image in the later part of the 19th century. That's so Stop. Even the leg, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It made me also think, um, for, and since you were talking about Dalacroix's classicism yesterday, whether, so this is 1843. So whether he's been influenced by the mural decorations, where he's doing all of those classical bodies, um, because she's, you know, that, that's really what it's reminiscent of. Uh, in the Ophelia behind you, I didn't get a chance to look at it up close yet, but from this distance, it also reminds me of Goya. Yes. yes. Oh, I right. wanted to hear you say a little bit more about that, especially yeah. classical right. horses. Right. You know. Oh, yeah. I, I think well, this one is so strong. With the naked and all that. Oh, that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. The angularity here is a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the questions that I would have would be actually to look at iconography in terms of low prints popular prints, pornographic prints, mm -hmm. because I don't know who did this first, but I can tell you that by 1850, women sprawling along the edge of banks, grasping very suggestive tree branches, mm -hmm. is, is part and parcel of a whole genre of sort of bathing in nymphs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in France. Because I certainly know it in England, but I would Yeah, no, actually, and they're, they're looking even back to 18th century traditions. So I don't know who done it first, but it could be really interesting actually to take a look at that because I can actually send you Good. a full load. Special cash. I know. But it's, it's an interest of mine to look at the Rococo revival in the 19th century and um, sort of the eroticism of popular prints on the nude in particular. So this is why I happen to have a bit of a grounding in that. Being <laughs> indoors, various sorts of people are setting it. They're outdoors also? In the 19th century, it pretty yeah. much becomes an outdoor trope with the sort of outdoor, they're bathers, they're nymphs, they're in the woods, and there's sort of varying degrees of reality. Um, lithographs? Uh, lithographs, some are, it depends on the period. Uh, I don't know about aquatint. But um, no, I mean, to me, the, the image is very familiar in a way, and that eroticism could actually be coming from, you know, we know that he was looking at, you know, a more erotic type of Rococo-like images and popular prints, so that could be an interesting iconographic source to explore. Well, to pull us out of the gutter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm Barras, um, Narcissus, Brousseau, um, gender shifting all over the place, right, yes. but that's kind of that, what I feel yeah, right away. Someone has suggested that it is coming out of the because painting is in the business, and obviously Poussin is a big hero at times. And there's a supine figure. How do you account for the different portrayal of Canberra? in the painting and drawing. It's quite often it's much more, we're talking about this feminist figure, it's much more masculine figure. Exactly. I, I don't accept it to say it's a puzzle that, yes, he does have more masculine appearing. And I don't know whether, some of them look like they were done, one of them in particular, it looks like it was done after a model. It's the one for um, Howard and Polonius. I don't know that it, for sure that it was. Well, if it was done over nine years, then he probably released himself from oh. necessarily being consistent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that maybe yeah. is too functional, deterministic an explanation, but the well, he, extended yeah, temporality. I, I, was, I don't think that's too functional at all. I think that, you know, he was known to work quickly, and it's less important. He does it, he likes what he does. <laughs> he doesn't have a great, he's not like, oh my God, I have to have this match. How would he live now? And I think that it's just one of the things. Maybe he can't find the thing that he did earlier, so he just does another without. He's not a scholar. He's it's a so painter. Yeah. <laughs> I would also say, and this is going to, I'll talk about this this afternoon, but that for Delacroix to not fix a figure was also an important part of how he wanted people to respond. If Hamlet looked exactly the same in each one of these images, 
that would give Hamlet this fixed mm. identity mm -hmm. that I think he wanted to avoid. He wanted there to be this sort of, um, for the viewer to make their own image. So if the viewer had several different options mm. for Hamlet, then when they internalized that, they could come up with their own kind mm. of representation. That, that makes, I think the thing that makes it um, Something that it's a bit new in his work is that it is in this cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe one expects more in a cycle consistency, but, but obviously that, you know, that's not at all. But I think he would be more worried in a cycle about becoming too literary too, when he says the point oh, to yeah, he so doesn't he want to. Too illustrational. Yeah. yeah. But he's doing over nine years. It, it's not only drawing, it's drawing attention to the mobility of himself in response to and and adapting to different kinds of media, et cetera, over nine years. But in this, I mean, the, the elephant in the room for me is that this is a radically different mm -hmm. treatment of lithograph than yeah. the, the whole yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and part of it, or yes, right? The other thing is, it's, um, it's the one outdoor scene, and so he's using the, the, the individual strokes of the crayon mm -hmm. to indicate, like, right, He doesn't use any kind of cross hatching or right. kind of tightness over there. And so you've got, in terms of that thing about the uh, mobility of the body, mobility of the body is also uh, registered in this kind of uh, factor. You know, it's like it's more factor. Right? You know, it reminds me of like Fragonard, you do do that kind of eroticism of individuals. A lot more white paper. A lot yeah. more white paper. Yeah. yeah. He did do this in a painting paper. before, and I didn't talk about that because right. I thought. But um, he did do three paintings of this scene, and in this case, the painting preceded the lithograph. Um, so, I, and, and the reason I was thinking about what you said is that in the painting, there's this extraordinary translucency to the body dissolving into the water. Um, and so, you know, he may have been trying to capture that effect in, in a lithograph. Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah. Is he using other print media? Like, yes, he did lots of herself and so there's this acute psychological erotic tension of her so maybe it is connected in some way to, to these erotic prints but it's very deliberately not her floating in the water but the moment before she releases herself to the other side and one other thing I didn't talk about that you that there is a whole debate um, in the 19th century and I guess probably subsequently whether Ophelia dies accidentally without breaks mm -hmm. or whether she has committed suicide, and that's part of the play. And so people really read that differently. Um, I think of it as still a classic strategy sort of ambiguity or um, that it's an accident, but I don't have any real basis for saying So if you think the battle's going to break here or she's going to let go? Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is your, what you I am not sure why I think that he's interested in just having accidental. I don't know why. Okay. I don't have any. Well, the, the standing of feelings that you showed in this earlier prints, the way that they are you know, precariously on the edge, but sort of their body weight is over right. the water, and then that then makes it look like, oh, I slipped and then, so that would suggest that those other interpretations are leaning in the accidental death direction. Whereas the, I think one of the things, the great tension in this yes. is, is that you, you know, it can go either way. It's like a lot you know, of and that that sort of it gives it an electric charge that if it were an accident or even if it were a suicide and it felt like a completed it mental charge, yeah. decision that that would be different again. So how is she supportive? 
I mean, obviously not from the branch, it's too weak. <laughs> I mean, it's a miracle that it's him. Yeah, because they're him, so they should be in the water. You know, is she, is there a kind of rock under the water? Yeah. Or maybe that's the, the water shower. There's water, water to the water. There's something in the water. Oh, it makes me think of poor grow. Only takes one. Only four Well, yeah, I mean, I am interested in the outstretched arm gesture, and I, I was just thinking totally psychoanalytic reading, maybe Darcy will agree with me, but <laughs> I think that, you know, there's the, that arm, it's the combination of the male and the female body in one, um, the arm in this case is just so, you know, erect, and then the rest of the body being the, um, being the supine, the soft, the melting, so there is a way that the two genders come together. And that so much hinges on that arm, what's going to happen there, so. Well, the whole construction, we were kind of loosely talking about how it's feminine. Yeah. And the construction of femininity is, is in the size of this, his incapacity right. to act, and his right. kind of foolish playing, he's always playing, so it's superficiality. And so this, this is a scene, if, it, if it's contingent on decision making, masculine decision making, yeah. or like, oops, you know, the slippery mm -hmm. slide, it, it, and it, it brings up at least that material. Um, well, since your last comment was about Hamlet's failure to take his sword out of the kitchen, you clearly have a good of reading of this week that fits us to me. What can I say? <laughs> Ike, did you, did the museum just purchase this in a notice in 2013? Yes, Yes, so we did, and through Star's that? very incredibly valuable advice, and it was a very difficult decision, we were looking at two different sets. Um, and I don't know, Star, if you want to just speak a little bit to this, because it was one of those confounding, you know, perplexing situations of trying to figure out different editions. Um, and the way that we have them matted uh, makes it a little bit harder to see, I think, that these are not all consistently from one set. Do you, do you want to say a little bit about that? Well, at the, I don't want to bore everybody with technicalities of print problems, but um, I've compared a lot of <coughs> other sets at, at the Met, um, at the Morgan, um, also one in a private collection that was offered to us that was, in fact, a posthumous 1864 edition. And there's quite a bit of difference in that printing. It's punchier. Uh, it doesn't have all the nuance. But I do believe uh, that this is the second printing of the, of the first, first edition, the way, the way you des describe things. There are three exceptional ones, but that's part of the course. It's, it's, nobody has actually figured all of this out. But when he died, there were extra impressions that were left over from the first printing. Uh, but not all of them, and so there is no full set. We think that Berthaud probably printed a second round before the stone was passed on. But uh, the details of each one and why I think it's so, it, I don't need to bore you with. <laughs> and, and they cleaned up a treat, though. They were not in perfect nick, um, but now I think they, they look pretty glorious. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to be able to have these two major acquisitions um, of De La Croix now in the permanent collection. So where we had no romanticism, now we have at least some. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, uh, but really fascinating. I, I um, am very ignorant of the complexities of the interpretation of this particular play. But um, even in just trying to remember the very complicated, convoluted plot, which it really is a convoluted plot, um, it always puzzles me in trying to think on Ophelia, uh, what the function of that entire narrative is in relationship to the whole major overriding issue of the relationship between Hamlet and his father and vengeance and all of that. Um, so I, I don't know. If, is that a, that's probably a completely silly question, and everybody else knows the answer to it, but I have never really gotten the whole... I, I would turn around for 
some literary scholar. Yeah, I don't know if anybody seems to know a great deal about Hamlet. Well, well what, what, what exactly were you asking? I didn't quite. Because um, it always seems to me when I think about the plot that the uh, purported romance or potential romance or maybe there was no romance. Oh, okay. Okay. So and I Hamlet. think Shakespeare tends to make the women more decisive. If you look at like Romeo and Juliet, Juliet dies in like 13 months and Romeo takes pages and pages and pages. So, uh, you know, to die. And I think the fact that Julia, I mean, that Ophelia has an idea and she just acts on it. And I also think get thee to a nunnery is, is definitely like saying, you know, it's like, it's like you're an impossible tease. Get out of here. And that Hamlet says to Ophelia. Mm -hmm. Um, and that could have been like an old, you know, she's clearly, Shakespeare's women tend to act more quickly once they have decided something and with less posing than the men do. And Hamlet is it is also um, so vexed the relationship between Ophelia and Hamlet's relationship to his mother. Yeah. So you have to kind of get rid of her so that it can be really, really heightened tension about <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the 19th century, <laughs> it's jealousy. She, Ophelia, was much minimized, and so it's actually even the madness scene is only begins for for translations and for illustrators only begins to um, be done at the end of the 18th century. She was, that was ignored. Um, so she actually has more prominence in 19th century stage productions than she did before, um, even though it's. A, a, I guess you would say line by line, a minor role compared to Hamlet and other figures. Yeah. It just occurred to me also that it's Shakespeare's use of a particularly French classical device in that he has, it, it has, has to happen off stage for death and mm. it's narrated by someone else. Mm -hmm. And that and that was so in the, um, the bien séance, you couldn't mm -hmm. have somebody get it on stage, right. so. And it's yeah. narrated by by Hamlet's mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that conflation then mm -hmm. is a perfect one. So, okay. Answer. <laughs> answer. Sorry. <laughs> um, did you want any, uh, want us to look at anything in particular further as we're all standing here jammed into this little gallery? Does anybody have anything else they want to address? Well, actually, I'm pressed with the recap. Um, so my reading of the, the theatre debates in the 1820s, mm -hmm. there's, a, the, uh, there's a tremendous admiration for Othello as the most French of Shakespeare's plays and the accelerated action and the debate between Racine and you know, the Aristotelian unities. So I was wondering when Hamlet has seen this tremendous popularity exactly in, in France. Hamlet's popularity? Yeah. And so, uh, I, I probably am not going to be able to give anything but a more, more, most, mostly general answer that um, Hamlet just does become very, very popular in the 19th century. But there, there are Shakespeare play, as, you know, because just I was surprised by how Othello was treated so tremendously. The French has really seized upon that. You know. But, but there was a group of them, the Othello, I mean, there was this, sort of like, well, we may, might even think of it as the classic tragedies all become really popular. So when the theater companies come from England, they, they do Othello, they do Hamlet, they do Julian, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and so forth. So that, uh, they may all be equally popular, really. May, I'm just, may I comment on this yeah. also? Popular to the extent that um, in the years, right, when they were, the theater companies were coming to Paris to present, uh, these images from Shakespeare were, were appearing on printed textiles that people were using in their homes. So I think that gives you a good slip on how popular the images actually were. That's fascinating. These are the furnishing fabrics that were used for the draperies and the beds. So were they 12 jouets? 12 jouets, yes. Okay, so they but at were that point it wasn't jouets. It was Rouen and elsewhere. Right. Yes. Right. In France and in England also. These were printed in France. Yeah. Have, have you looked at how the prints and drawings and paintings of Alexandre Louis Collin, who Delacroix shared the studio with for about four years, um, 
And they do exactly the same subject. Sometimes Colin's doing it first, sometimes Bella's doing it first. And they're choosing Shakespeare, uh, you know, Goethe, those kind of subjects repeatedly. And presumably there's a whole, I mean, there are other artists as well, but Colin in particular, and they both come out of Gerard's studio at the same time. And they're living together, doing these same prints. Have you compared ever the Colin prints and with these series? No. That, that would be seems like that would be... Because he did a Toronto fellow as well, and they, they do exactly, more or less the same time, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's Delacroix first and sometimes Colin. And Colin's the one who introduces Bonington to, mm -hmm. in doing these same subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, and there might be a relationship also with uh, Achille de Verria, because, uh, particularly because they were working together on prints, and um, I think that, that, that it's a likely uh, sort of crossover there also. Again, sort of looking at Delacroix beyond Delacroix. like a Debbie Downer, you know, it's kind of like, you know, everybody's talking about these, in these lofty terms about the ideas behind the pictures, and I just feel like this heavy weight, you know, I'm going to talk about the nuts and bolts of, of the picture, so, um, so bear with me as we uh, crash into earth. Um, I came upon, oh, also I, I apologize because um, Claire and I are, talking about many similar aspects and many of the quotes that I'm going to be using uh, have been mentioned before. Um, I came upon this title um, last summer when I was pressed by the organizers of the exhibition uh, to come up with something for the brochure and I hadn't really thought too much about it. Um, and this is kind of my first reaction um, to this topic. Um, and I have this reaction uh, based upon uh, my first encounter as a conservator with Delacroix. And um, this is the first painting that I, this is the painting that I examined uh, as a conservator uh, when I was in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And I was, uh, so I was putting together this talk and I was trying to find an image of this picture. And I didn't realize this picture was even going to be in the exhibition. I mean, it kind of just flipped me out. And um, when I examined it, I was working at Williamstown before I went to the Walters. And it was owned by uh, George Hurd Hamilton, who was the, uh, who had been a director at the Clark. So it was owned privately. Um, and then in 1988, it was sold to the Canton of Zurich, and then they gave it to the uh, Kunsthaus in Zurich. And so this, I was really excited when I came up and I was given this painting to treat. You know, it was my first Delacroix, and it was a major picture. Um, and I started examining it under the microscope in ultraviolet and infrared and all the typical things that one did 30 years ago. <laughs> and um, th these are some excerpts from the report that I wrote at that time. Uh, the painting is signed in black paint. The dark paint is sensitive and most of the image is in dark colors. The paint is vehicular with glazing in the darks with little impasto work. The paint slash ground probably led white as cupped and cracked. There is insoluble oil retouching in the faces, figures, and background darks as seen in ultraviolet. Reds are slightly sensitive to acetone, darks sensitive to acetone, 
and very soluble in ethanol. The coating is soluble in ethanol, in acetone and ethanol. So um, as you can guess, I didn't treat the painting. Uh, there was nothing I could really do in terms of cleaning the painting um, to remove this discolored coating uh, or to remove the retouching. Uh, it, was, it was just a very complicated picture. So I was somewhat disappointed, um, but you know, it, it's obviously much better to be conservative. Um, and so again, when I started putting this together, talk, this talk more recently, I called up Ike and I said, or I emailed Ike and said, so what's the picture look like? Because I was concerned that maybe someone treated it since I couldn't treat it. <laughs> and uh, I, I believe that maybe the picture has been surface cleaned and someone varnished it again. It looks very shiny, but it, it is a very dark picture, which you can see, and it does have a very cupped surface to it, which is quite distracting. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, actually talk more just in general about Delacroix's painting technique. Um, this is a detail from uh, the picture that's, our picture that's in the exhibition. And I'm going to relate issues of his technique to the five Delacroix paintings that we have in our collection. And uh, they span from 1829 to 1854. Um, and they exhibit a lot of the issues that one finds uh, typically in Delacroix paintings. Um, let's see. Uh, first, let me just start by um, talking a little bit more about um, Delacroix's own writings. Um, here's a photograph from 1861, and this is a quote that came up yesterday. Uh, and this, I love this photograph of Paris. It's a contemporary photograph of Paris um, that I found and had to include because I love it so much. With our moderns, a depth of intention and sincerity shines even in their faults. Unfortunately, their material processes are not on the same level as those of their predecessors. All these paintings will soon perish. And as I mentioned yesterday, I'm not quite sure, and maybe you know better than I do, um, if uh, Delacroix considered himself a modern. You know, was he assuming that his paintings were going to perish, uh, like he is talking about uh, with the other um, artists, the moderns? And as we were saying, you know, he did actively see some of his own pictures start to uh, disintegrate before his eyes. Um, as all of you know, um, Delacroix wrote a lot about his techniques. Um, he wrote in his journals, um, and here are some um, details from his journals. Um, and he writes uh, perhaps as guides for his assistants who will help him. Um, he, uh, suggest, he writes down suggestions by his contemporaries uh, for procedures. In 1850, for instance, he wrote about Apollo victorious over the serpent python, the part of the sky after the largest areas of sunlight, that is to say already dark, chrome yellow shot with white, lacquer white and vermilion, castle earth and white form the diminishing half tones, the lights pale yellow on the clouds below the chariot, cadmium white a point of vermilion, However, these do not constitute necessarily proof for scholars. They could be just intellectual speculation. And also, as you know, Delacroix envisioned writing a dictionary of fine arts intended for pedagogic use. Um, and also in um, 1997, uh, these notes were discovered, uh, these, these account books kept by his housekeeper that had daily expenditures. Um, and two professional account books, one noting the expenditures for the materials used at the Church of San Sulpice, and also day-by-day -day records of orders for pigments, canvas, oil, turpentine, wax, and so forth from Etienne Francois Haro. Um, also, of course, as you know, a Louis de Planet described working with the artist in his memories of working on paintings with Monsieur Eugene Delacroix. 
And here's an illustration we've seen a number of times already. Um, and you know, as I, one thing that I noted yesterday was that it seems to me it's uh, Claire, Claire mentioned the big windows, which are obviously are really important for an artist, and um, how neat and tidy this place is. Just really, as an artist studio, kind of amazes me. But of course, it was probably a gallery where he brought collectors and dealers. Um, I want you to take note here of his paint box. Um, and here is his actual paint box. And this is a palette. We've seen a number of palettes. Uh, this palette is in the collection of the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, and it was collected by George Lucas. Uh, George Lucas was from Baltimore and lived most of his life in Paris as a dealer and agent and kind of the go-between between, between American collectors and French artists. Um, and he was an advisor to uh, the Walters family. Um, and he collected pallets, I mean, go figure. But that's great, isn't it? And one thing that I was really interested in uh, finding out about this pallet was if Delacroix jumped on the bandwagon and used new pigments. And let me just show you, um, this is the back of the palette, and there's a signature, and this is his, uh, there's a wax seal, and you can see it says E.D., um, Ed, <laughs> or Eugene Delacroix. Um, and I was, as I said, interested to know if there were uh, new pigments on this palette. So for instance, I was wondering if there were chrome containing, containing pigments, if cadmiums were there, um, he writes about those. Um, and indeed, this, uh, pig, this palette was analyzed um, by the Smithsonian in 2005. Uh, they did uh, non-invasive techniques with x-ray fluorescence, and they also did use scanning electron microscope. And indeed, we have cadmium-containing pigments there, and we have chrome-containing pigments there. So we have actual proof that he did use new materials as they came out on the market. And would have been the rather than tubes? No, no, and that's a good question. I, I would assume they would actually be in tubes um, because there were paintings, uh, there were materials that were produced then that were already ready uh, to just use very easily uh, that he probably got at Harrow's um, art supply store. And we'll hear more about um, this uh, art supplier later on. But also, Hero was an art, tra transported art, and he also restored paintings. So there was a very um, close connection there. And another thing I just wanted to uh, remind you of, which I talked about a little yesterday, was um, the discoloration of some of these, pig some of these pigments. And so uh, if you look, at the upper left corner, you can see there's, I mean, most of these, these paints look black, um, but they're really not black. You know, as I pointed out before, that's chrome green. So one can imagine that a lot of these darks in his pictures have really lost their original vibrancy and intensity and color. Like well, that's, that's a good question. It could be a presentation palette. It could, be, it could have been a palette that was uh, put together to give to Lucas. And uh, that was done very often. A lot of these palettes in the Lucas collection at the BMA are like that. Uh, we have a, and, many and many artists. I mean, we have a wonderful uh, palette of, with Barry's hand on it at the Walters. I mean, it's crazy. And it's, it's really nice, but obviously it was not used um, as a palette. However, that being said, we still have information on that palette, which tells us that he did use these, these pigments, which had just come out on the market. Um, Delacroix talks about, and uh, he writes in his diary, that he used uh, chrome pigments in uh, the painting Autumn, uh, Bacchus and Ariadne, which is in Brazil. 
there um, is a sketch for it, an oil sketch for it that's in the fog.
um, what, what may and may not be a Delacroix in, in this exhibition. Um, this painting also exhibits some of the same cracking, especially in the darks that we've mentioned before. Um, I talked about how dark this picture is, um, and I'll um, talk again about uh, the varnishing recipes that uh, Delacroix used. In a letter to Edouard Soule in February 1845, he wrote, I send you a shipment of paintings. I dare to ask that you do everything possible to protect them from the rain. My paintings are varnished with egg whites, and the slightest drop of water will make dreadful stains. Uh, four years later, he noted in his journal, I am experiencing with the painting Women of Algiers how agreeable and even necessary it is to paint on varnish, which is what Claire was mentioning yesterday. Um, on February 24, 1852, he wrote, um, Carignon told me how to provisionally varnish a painting. It is with gelatin, like that sold by butchers, which one dissolves in a little water and applies to the painting with a sponge. To remove it, one again uses warm water. On October 4th, that same year, he writes with regard to a supplier, Haro uses to give his paintings a matte surface, wax dissolved in turpentine with the addition of a little oil of lavender. And other descriptions underscore the importance of varnish below, above, between, and within the various layers of the painting. In fact, on February 7th, 1849, he noted, one must find a means of rendering only the lower levels of varnish invulnerable to subsequent varnish removal operations, or first varnish the oil sketch with a varnish that cannot be removed. And to this end, and this again is, <laughs> Uh, Claire mentioned this. Uh, Delacroix often used copal, and here are some jars of copal. This is new copal, and you can see how it starts out fairly dark. I mean, it's starting out kind of a, a dark um, yellowish brown. Of course, when you apply it a very thin layer over a picture, it's not going to have the same color um, because you're just applying a very thin layer. But it does start out discolored, and it gets more discolored. And um, it's very resistant to most solvents. It's, it's very hard to remove. And he talks about coating his palettes with copal. And this may be so that the, the paint itself, the pigments, don't sink into the wooden palette. You know, it acts as a barrier. Um, let's see. Regarding. Uh, varnishes and varnish removal. He wrote to Harrow about the varnish removal of the Mets, uh, the painting that's now at the Mets, Christ on the Sea of Galilee, which was painted in 1853. If it proves necessary to remove the varnish before it is retouched, in my eyes, it will be a dishonored painting. Varnish removal is regarded as a trifling thing. It is extremely harmful. I much prefer a hole in a painting. And uh, interestingly enough, later he wrote, um, after seeing a cleaned Rubens painting, uh, uh, he was looking at this painting without a varnish, he wrote, it would be desirable never to use varnish. And this obviously would be because he, the colors are so brilliant. And this is the last painting um, in our collection by Delacroix, the, um, chronologically. 1854, Christ on the Sea of Galilee. And as you know, uh, there are many versions of this. And Ike brought them to get a lot of them together beautifully in the exhibition at the Walters and was at Phoenix. And it was a real highlight seeing these different versions around the wall and seeing how um, Delacroix developed the theme. Um, regarding the, uh, oh, let me just show you also, interestingly enough, this is the back of the painting. One doesn't often see that. And I just wanted to show you the canvas stamp because we've been talking about Hero quite a bit. And so here is uh, the stamp from uh, the paint merchant. And the painting had been lined, and then they removed the lining. This was, I think, in the 60s or 70s. And then, of course, they lined it again. So fortunately, they did take a photograph <laughs> of the back before it was, was relined. Um, What's the second time? Sorry? 
uh, beneath the arrow stamp, there is a so second it's a, one. It's the dealer. It's the dealer? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, oh, he's the art supplier. Okay. Arrow, yes, I know. Yes, great. Thank you. And, uh, right. So, um, Regarding adding finishing touches, he wrote, it is very difficult. The danger arises when one reaches a point where reworking is no longer useful. And I'm a man prone to reworking. Um, and we see some of the dangers of that um, when we look at uh, a detail. And again, we can see uh, the cracking uh, in this barrel. This is an old raking light photograph. Um, but what we can also see in, in these, especially in raking light photographs, are the, the build, is the buildup of the paint, the, the impasto. And, and again, Claire was mentioning this yesterday, um, how Delacroix insisted on the importance of projection or relief, illusionistic and real. He writes, always use a lot of impasto. Pay no attention to outlines. This quality is now so often lost due to linings. This is again what he wrote. However, um, Delacroix felt that the execution should be a means to an end and not the end product itself, which is to reinforce the thought itself. One should have control. The hand will have very little importance. Only the mind and the eye of the painter will have a role to play. And as early as 1824, he wrote, the great thing is to avoid the infernal facility of the brush. And again, it's, it's interesting, because I was talking about this with Ike when um, I first saw the show, um, how we look at these pictures, and you know, the, I look at the pictures, and I just think they're so luscious, the way he uses the paint and the impasto and the thin areas and the thick areas, and yet this wasn't his goal, you know, this wasn't what he really was striving for. He wanted this whole idea, the story, the emotion to come through. But while doing that, he created this incredible technique. Um, so in conclusion, um, you can see that Delacroix had a very complex painting technique and his paintings began actively deteriorating during his lifetime. He valued contrast between high impasto and thin paint application, emulating Rubens. But these techniques were a means to an end, not the end product in itself. He incorporated new materials as soon as they came on the market and interlaid or interlayered different resins and adhesives throughout his paintings. And finally, a more scientific analysis should be carried out to compare his, paint, his written words to his actual paintings. Um, I'd like to just end this little presentation by showing you um, another painting in the Walters that was bought in 1902, uh, attributed to Walters. And um, it's obviously after the Marie de Medici cycle in the Louvre. And um, <clears throat> it was a signed painting when it came into the museum. Um, and in 1937, they uh, examined the picture and found that the uh, signature was painted over cracks. And they said that it was very soluble and they removed the signature. And I just wanted to show you some details um, in case any of you have any ideas about who might have painted it. <coughs> any hands? <laughs> um, but one thing I will point out, um, after having seen all of the details that I've shown you, I hope you can see that uh, the brushwork here does not really compare to the brushwork that we saw um, in the details of the earlier pictures. Um, thank you very much. So we can go out to the gallery and uh, look more closely. And, and I hope that really facilitates our looking um, when we go into the galleries. And I wanted to ask all of you this question before I lose your attention. That is, we also would like, if you are willing, to record um, guide by cell stops. I don't know if you're familiar with this rather rudimentary technology, but we're capable of recording you from any landline. And I would love to be able to <coughs> capture your spontaneous response to some of the 
the paintings that you worked on paper in the show and add that as a layer of extra didactics um, so that people can access through their cell phone your commentary. So if you would be willing or interested in doing that, I'd be really grateful. I know, for example, that Eric has so many incredible insights into the technique that are so revealing for our public. So just if you could keep that in mind as you're going through, if you think of things that you would like to address, we'd be so grateful. Thanks, let's go into the galleries now. This painting is a puzzle to me because it um, does have a signature that looks right, although from the conservation study that was done, apparently the signature was not coincident with the original execution of the painting. Um, it also, obviously, it has a completely different feel to it uh, than what we see in his preparatory esquisse, that's for sure what we just looked at in terms of the presentation sketch. So it may be, I don't know, a collaborative work with maybe a student like Andre Yu. I don't know if we're at the point where we can even recognize Andre Yu's touch and distinguish it from the other students. Yeah, there's a kind of an opacity throughout the figures that seems inconsistent with the fact that it's a sketch. I mean, I'm not seeing that kind of variation between thin and opaque areas that I would expect in something that's so loosely handled as this. I know that he wasn't, you feel, you feel that this is someone in control of his craft who is, there, and also the vagueness of the edges here. Is, That's yet yeah, a kind of not worrying about the persuasive. contours. Yeah, I think it's so very too. Persuasive. And I like the fact that when you look at this little piece of red drapery in the back, he laid in the stroke quite broadly, and then went back and just um, you know defined the, the corner there. That's again that seems mm -hmm. in, that seems consistent with the way he might have modeled the form. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I see edges the toga there, and that looks like an alizarin um, crimson. Um, against like, a, is it a cadmium? Like I'm wondering, was that you know just that ribbon of cadmium? I mean, I lo know he loved alizarin crimson, but I'm just wondering, and it kind of seems to be integrated with like umbers and, uh, um, in there. I'm just wondering, you know, just to going on Abby's observation, this seems to be one of the most beautiful parts of the handling of the whole painting. It just seems to be handled with. He's been given embroidery in a way that you know is different to the other figures. So I'm just mm -hmm. just wondering about that. Do you have any? I can't tell what that color is. I mean, it looks brown to me, but maybe which color had, are you talking about? You're talking about, about the border here. Yeah, the border. I mean, oh, I would have thought it was vermilion, Chinese cinnabar. But what about this this darker border? Here? Yeah, the darker border. Oh, the darker. The darker. Border. Oh, oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure. It, it just looks brown now, whether there was a little bit of the red lake in there or not. I'm not sure. Eric, like, I was wondering if you could tell me, tell us more about the coloration of the painting, this painting, as it relates to this image here. Because this image to me looks like it has high contrast. And when I look at this image and I look at these pictures, I see uh, a real loss of color in terms of almost <laughs> all of these figures here. So for instance, you see this would be kind of a greenish sea focal blue, and you see all these colors that you were talking about in the colors. And this, this is just so much more um, almost black and white with red. <laughs> and this is so warmer and so that's so much more bright. And I'm, I've never seen the original picture, so I don't know. And I'm just wondering. I'm wondering if the original picture hasn't darkened. Right, and because again, we were talking about those darks and the resins mm -hmm. and all of that, but uh, you've seen, I assume you've seen the yes. picture. No, it, it is darker, definitely. And I, I assume that the... Wait, what the, is dark? The whole, the page, the whole painting the... is darker in okay. reality. Um, it's probably a little bit exaggerated in a digital image, but um, the one thing that I noted right away in looking at the actual painting in Lyon is that it's much more theatrically lit in exactly 
the way that you feel right here. So the darker, these colors are actually darker. I mean, whether or not they were originally supposed to be quite that dark, they were never. Right. I mean, it's like a, it's like a blue. It's, it's, like, it's a like a brown. royal right. blue. <laughs> it's a deep blue in the painting. Blue in the painting. Okay. Um, but, you know, again, when you read the, the uh, description by Planet and Delacroix, how the thing was put together as a collaborative work, right? So Planet takes the sketch, it transfers it to the canvas, lays out the whole thing, and then Monsieur Delacroix comes in and retouches the whole surface. So it has a completely different uh, surface quality to it. There is an actual term that they use to describe that technique in Delacroix's practice, which I can't remember at the moment. Um, but you know, it has a very different feel overall than the touch that you have in the easel-sized version, for sure. But you know, again, you can see where uh, I would have been misled initially when I saw the original JPEGs of this painting. I assumed, oh, we must be a preparatory sketch for the big one in Lyon. Uh, but then when you actually see the painting and you consider the way in which Dorafa paints, um, if there are looseness, if there's looseness in certain areas, it doesn't necessarily indicate that it is a preparatory sketch in any way. It seems to me to be a reconsidered version of the story with a greater concentration on the principal figures and not on all of them as you have in the big, the big Lyon version. Right. On the composition, when you when we talk about it, it's tempting to compare it with the Poussin death of Germanicus, or something, which is French. Isn't he looking more to Guerin, actually, the death of Cato of Utica, which is where the figure of is, is much closer, the figure of Marcus Aurelius is much closer to Cato than it is in the way it's posed. I, I wasn't really making a direct uh, causal right. relationship between Poussin and, I mean, mostly what I was just gesturing at is that Poussin's deathbed scenes are sort of the bedrock of the entire tradition of the deathbed scene as it keeps on getting reiterated throughout the rest of the 18th century and, and into the 19th century. That's all I meant, but you're probably right. There are any number of more proximate colleagues who would have been functioning in his visual memory. Um, Just being painted when he was in the studio. Yeah. That's so, so, so as I understand, right, you think that this was done after the Lyon version, right? Uh, yes. So the um, director would have had this in mind one. So, so why did he omit certain things? Like, I'm intrigued by the fact that there is no food here, you see, in the drapery, and, um, and there is one very clearly marked. So how does this figure stand? That's not a foot there. What is this, this, this is the foot. No, no, I mean, this, like, even that? No. It's, what is it? It's, it's a... <laughs> No, no, it's, it's the onion. Yeah, I don't know what it is, I'm but it's excited. not a foot. Actually, one of the harder things like this in, in, in Duraqua, don't you find, is trying to figure out yeah. how, oh, it's the, actually this how the feet yeah. correspond. Okay. They always yes. get all kind of tangled up. Uh, he's, he's incredibly good at uh, not being clear about where the body is, okay. um, with rare exception. I mean, this figure, though, which is so lovely in, in the Lyon version, I think is equally even more beautiful in, in the Santa Barbara variant. There's something incredibly touching about that figure. So can, can I ask a question? Because uh, I find all of your arguments actually very convincing. And when you look at it, you know, for the most part, there are, you know, there's just, it's Delacroix's handling, and uh, there's confidence and variation. And for all the reasons you say, that's convincing. There's one detail that bothers me. That's the face of Commodus. For me, that has like a kind of definiteness and a, a precision that is not Delacroix. I mean, it could be, who knows, that was just for a moment, Delacroix was not himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I, I kind of want to turn it around because I, I mean, compared to the Honolulu painting and the one beside it where you look at it and it's kind of like, you know, I don't think so. I mean, this one, it's like, I think so, I think so. But then there, yeah, there's Not this- the head of the guy on the right. Yeah, there are a couple of details too. where you're kind of put on your metal. And I'm just, sorry, rather than arguing for, I'd kind of like to hear, you know, um, if there are other, or like the reservation side. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's fair. Is no, that no, fair? no, that's per perfectly fair. I mean, one thing that I wondered whether or not people wanted to speak to is condition too, because the painting obviously had to be restored. Mm -hmm. but, um, I felt like 
the, this face and this face do not match the others. And um, maybe they were done by students or something else, but if you look at the rest of them, there is a uniformity. The one thing that I find very convincing for this painting is this detail, the way that's painted. And then you look at the larger version, and it seems like it's got to be the same hand. You look at that stroke on the bigger one, the Lyon version, and it's very similar in terms of holding the brush. It's not, you know, they're both done spontaneously. They're not constructed triangles that are put together. Well, have a go, please. I'm, I'm actually kind of sick of talking about this <laughs> painting. <laughs> I'm struck by is you very briefly mentioned that you know this was initially the thought was you know part of the Pelican Bone Library project. So you know whether this was going to be a pendant or not. When I look from this angle, I can see the hexagon compared to the box likeness of this. Mm -hmm. That there is a hexagonality that I lose or it becomes more box-like, more rectangular when I stand in front of it. But there's something about that oblique, you know, mm -hmm. sharp perspective that draws our eye inside. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see the edges, you know, and then how it sort of curves down and then curves up again. And even the light, you know, arranges our eye around the hexagon. Mm -hmm. So I'm really wondering whether he was thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Just as a thought experiment, like, does it, does it fix? Is this photograph though cut at the bottom and at the top? I mean, it's, it's, might it not be slightly deceptive? It, I, don't, you know. I don't think it is. I mean, my vinyl guy, I think he did. No, but from, <laughs> from the JPEG you may have got from, you know, whatever you made it from, from the photograph from... from um, uh, it's possible, You know, for the cutting right on the documents there, which is displayed, yeah. placed quite differently in the, the small version. I, I'm wondering if in terms of this figure, and red over here, <clears throat> if it might have been left unpainted and someone came back later mm -hmm. and added that because the features, the painting, do not match the rest of the picture. I mean, this, these features are much more uh, precise as well, but quite not as... Uh, I, one can almost see that there's this pale blank surface mm -hmm. that's just been touched in with some dark paint. And so, I mean, and, and there is not a lot of bringing up to a high finish in the others, though there is much more of that in this figure here. Um, so there is this kind of uh, difference in terms of finish. And this one, again, I just think maybe nothing was there. And then maybe later somebody added something. I mean, and, if this does not match that, it doesn't match anything else. And this is, again, it brought up to a finish but a finish that I don't think you, I wouldn't automatically say that face looks like a Delacroix face. Are, are there any known instances of like Andrea touching up a sketch or not, a, you know, a, a smaller painting? I mean, you know, is that part of this legacy of Andrea, you know, um, enhancing the um, estate of Delacroix? And well, actually, the, the Sao Paulo pictures, which were the last. That Duracroix was working on, they were collaborative, and the speculation is that Andrea finished them. And during the big Philadelphia show, they were conserved, and all of that paint was removed to restore it. And there was ones this size. That, that, that no, well, those were uh, these great big decorations. Oh, okay. yeah. So you know, I, I'm struggling to think of an example where we would have documented that type of interference on the part of Andrea on a, a version of, of something like, of this scale. Um, you know, the polisson argument that we get about uh, uh, Andrea deliberately uh, selling things uh, that he, were, he knew were his own sketches, I mean, that, I think they were still the small, yeah. little ones. And, you know, and again, I don't know what to call those, the sketch copies right. that he did, whose function remains to me kind of mysterious. Um, I mean, and again, again about the face of, uh, of Commodus, you know, to me, it really does just signify a completely different approach to the subject because I do think he is made very uh, girly, girlish, very effeminate, um, not too far off in type 
to the femme d'Alger even um, in their kind of lima bean shaped face and <laughs> softness. But you know, I think it just changes the tenor entirely of the way that you respond to the relationship between Marcus Aurelius and, and Commodus. So Commodus, again, you know, I'm just rehearsing my argument. I'm sure you've already read it before, but you know, Commodus in the Lyon version does look like Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator the movie. And you know, <laughs> probably Ridley Scott was looking at this painting when he invented that character. But there is a sort of simple dynamic of black and white and good and evil and blah, blah, blah. Whereas here, you know, to me, there does seem to be a, a tenderness that, that you feel um, and you're much more compassionate towards him because he seems like a tender youth. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the fiery red robe remains and he's got that build of sensuality, he's got the Lysippian curve of the hips, all of the feminizing attributes are there that you see in the big one um, in, from Lyon. There's something about the rendering of the facial features that really changes the emotional uh, dynamics of, of the scene. Um, can I just make one comment about the, the sort of like uh, amazing composition of the, of the, uh, the death of Germanicus to his count? There's a, an incredible book end to this, you know, the scenic neoclassical frieze that's afforded by the figure of, uh, of Plato in the death of Socrates in the Metropolitan David um, uh, from 1787. But when you go back to really, just what Todd was saying about tilting it towards the orthogonal, orthogonal and perhaps really activating the raft, you immediately lose the bookend. So you, you have this cluster of sort of less important figures just rounding it off the, the sort of, you know, they're just like grouped around, sort of staring at his, at his feet. And this is the most, this is the bookend gets, you know, put in front here. And so there's kind of a loss of um, uh, interest almost and attention to this, this little group of figures here who are just kind of like p packed in there. And mm -hmm. then the most um, kind of, for me, the weakest part of the painting is that very, you know, almost incompetent profile done with a very sort of thin brush, yes. sort of a sticky brush. You know, it, sort doesn't, of it doesn't ring just, true. Yeah, kind of just mm -hmm. like, as Eric was saying, kind of popped on with a, you know, at the end. So just an interesting how that ambition about the deathbed scene that you trace so beautifully in your essay um, has an effect then in, a, in, in, in turn on the sort of um, attributional dynamics within the painting. Mm -hmm. I, I know you, you've had this examined by conservator, infrared, x-ray, diagram. Do you have a conservator's report on yes. the condition? And is there anything you can kind of walk us through in terms of any significant areas of retouching um, that were discussed in that report? Well, I'm trying to remember uh, the detail of the report, which I haven't read in a while, but you know, aside from the, the tear that is documented yeah. and very visible, I mean, I think that there was this indication of cleaning. They saw it in this area, and so there was, I think there was a suspicion that there's significant paint loss um, over here. But I have to review it again. It's been a while since I read it. But I do think it's interesting what Eric is saying because uh, in the presentation sketch of the entry of the Crusaders into Constantinople, there are actually figures where the the face is left exactly. completely blank. So exactly. it's just right. an underground yeah. reddish pinkish area. Exactly. So that that to me You could imagine a, that he I, might have had a blank face. I could imagine mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, so exactly. that's an interesting line of speculation. I have a question about I keep on gravitating to that edge. Mm -hmm. And it's just luscious. I mean it uh, the, it seems like a very specific thing of looking at the problem of the dark and the light. And that's the area that's kind of occluded by the, or cropped or what have you. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, it, it makes me think of like 17th century, like uh, Meunier or something. I mean, is that, does that, is that look characteristic of that? I mean, it, it, it's almost uh, like he's trying to work in one particular area, working at a very, like, somewhat different um, set of relations than the other side. Um, does anybody have that impression? Or, or? Yeah, the painting's much more bodyful. You know, there's like a, a kind of a fatty in, in pasta there that there isn't in the, that gets brought up more. And I mean, just what pops into my head is the Jewish wedding. Yeah. Mm. And sort of the uh, back wall right, there, this right. kind of a, a bodiness to it, like mm -hmm. that chalky 
but it's also quite waxy and but I mean I, I think it's brilliant of you to yeah to see that kind of like this area seems to compel and grip and especially when you're talking about bookends I mean it's like trying to at least trying to articulate I mean it's, it's about the competition between that dark form and the, and the light and how much to Well, I mean, I, I, I take your point because actually the um, activating element, because of mm -hmm. the broadening of the composition, mm -hmm. ends up being this calm toy, mm -hmm. which in the big version is signaling just, uh, the edge of the composition, and in this version begins to echo the curve of Commodus. So there's a mm -hmm. liaison between mm -hmm. these two figures mm -hmm. that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the Jewish wedding is a very apt uh, parallel. Because um, if you think of Ralph Rubel's arguments in his essay on that painting, you know, the whole notion of the kind of screen wall, uh, oh, right. it, it, it's an interesting one. Um, but in that regard, the whole weight of the composition in terms of value has shifted remarkably to this side. Um, and you know, I, I, I again am, you know, in the Cezanne mode, wanting the whole thing to turn. Uh, <laughs> yes. Like yes. Yes. So, yes. 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 So, so yes. These right. figures are coming towards me, and I am concentrating now all of my pictorial attention on this dynamic right here. Mm -hmm. and, and these people are kind of like, in, as in the original um, compositional idea, when you look at the drawings, it's not just these figures; it's a great boatload of followers and uh, subservient people. Oh. So it's uh, it's Marcus Aurelius in his deathbed with a whole entourage, and then he whittles the composition down eventually. But you get that sort of sense of how they're much more subsidiary to this dynamic right here. And this actually ends up becoming a, a necessary warm uh, cush of the lazy mm -hmm. Susan, uh, if you will. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, I, I, I really do think that there is a very deliberate quality to the way that the, this figure is rendered and that the, the repositioning, the tilt of the head, you can see this little red halo behind him, that the sweetness of him is actually a very intentional part of the recasting of, of the painting. Um, but, you know, I, again, I've been staring at this for so long. If you, when you look at this opto in different kinds of light, this is a very particular type of light, uh, museum light. But, you know, you, you can see everywhere the type of complexity of little bits of flecks of color of the entire palette in the flesh. Um, and that ability is something that I just can't imagine the students can do. And, you know, we can look at the student work and uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But, you know, even this juxtaposition to me is, is pretty compelling. So, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, that's the mystery of it because it is, you're right, just in almost all its parts, so compelling that it's impossible to see it um, as as not in part by Delacroix. But there are those few places. Where, and I, I mean, I wonder about now that uh, this has been pointed out, the head of the red figure on the left, and yeah, that's even more problematic. But then again, you know, perhaps when we know it's by Delacroix, we just ignore the play that... Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I really find one of the most beautiful things about it is the, the, the differentiation between all the different draperies and the color of all, the arrangement of color mm -hmm. of all this, I, I think is very subtle and beautiful. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, What's the early history of it? What's the earliest we know of this sketch? Well, it's been in the same family since, we think, well, documented since the early part of the 20th century. But um, the, color, the objects that belong to this family are all consistently from the middle part of the 19th century. And it's all been contained within the one family and funneled into now one single family. Um, so it's one of many, many things that are pretty much from the same moment. Um, and there are some relatively spectacular objects, uh, decorative arts, that uh, are fairly you know, impressive, <laughs> let's say. Um, so that is another element in the background in terms of you know, my, my willingness to be able to receive this as an authentic painting. Because it's not a painting that has been 
roaming around or had been in a private collection and then sold and then into another private collection. It's always been in this one family. And did Johnson have any record or was there any record of no. any other person? No. No, no, no commentary anywhere about it. He, he didn't even see the painting. It was not that we were he, No, he's never, he'd never yeah. seen this painting. It was never brought to his attention. And you're talking about the Chicago Newbury Collection one, right? The, this one, yes. Lee yeah. Johnson had seen this. A black and white photograph of that. Yeah. Oh, the black, exactly. Yeah. Yes, he seems to have been fond of looking at black and white photographs. Of Bill That's all he could have access yeah. to, yeah. yeah. But you know, maybe we can look at the student works with. Uh, I have a, a last question. Sure. Uh, given the size of it, which is pretty manageable, did, did the, uh, the family take it to France? To I mean, Sebastien La Apollon is the Delacroix specialist, yeah. right? So did did that was that ever did that ever go overseas? It's not gone. Well, it was overseas and it has now moved here, but it hasn't. You know, we haven't tried to ship it. To France, but it's not even taking it in a place. We, that's very true, and I have actually, train, I have been trying to get in touch with Sebastien Ala for the last several years. Oh, so really? uh, it would be very nice of him to um, see the painting, and I hope that that happens one day. <coughs> I actually sent it to him by email. Uh, oh, I've sent it to him by email three times. <laughs> so he won't give opinions. Though. No, they can't, especially through email. And you can't import them to the bloody import VAT. It's a nightmare to import that's, that's something, you know. Really oh. yeah. Import okay. something in to get it and ask their opinion. Uh -huh. So obviously we need to uh, tempt Mithya now to get on a plane and to fly out here, here to look at the painting. Yeah. So. But why don't we look at the masquerade kiosk? Um,